Well, it's time for another of one of our topical talks. And today, a chance to focus on perhaps the smallest species that helps the world turn. Yes, we're talking about bugs, invertebrates. And uh, insects are under increasing threat as their habitats are taken over by man. And what can we do to help? Well, somebody who can help us understand this is Hayley Herridge, and she is a conservation officer for the Bristol-based charity, Bug Life. Hi there, Hayley. Hello, Mark. How are um, you? We're, we're based in Peterborough, but um, oh, I'm oh. based in Bristol. <laughs> oh, you're, okay. Let, well, the, that, that's the first mistake, but you're, you're, you're local to us here in Gloucestershire, and that's the main thing. So maybe yeah. you could start off by giving us a sort of a thumbnail sketch of how your interest uh, in bugs and your professional life started. Okay, well, um, I think I was fortunate to grow up in the middle of the countryside. And I grew up on a on a common that had some species rich grasslands, so lovely wildflower meadows full of orchids and, and other wildflowers. So I spent my childhood roaming around the countryside and and I did I spent a lot of time studying insects and flowers and and then obviously sort of I came back to it in later life with a kind of keen interest in conservation and nature. Yeah. And I found that. I found that I already had these kind of skills in identifying bugs and plants and things like that because I'd had this interest as a child and I'd had lots of time basically to observe nature. Um, so yeah, that I think that's where it all started is sort of playing with wildflowers when I was a child and uh, watching butterflies. How lovely. So you're one of those <laughs> lucky people that's actually turned a, a hobby and a passion into a job, into a career. Yes. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> and you before I understand you worked in Herefordshire for quite a few years. Yes, so I'm I'm from Herefordshire. So prior to um, working with Bug Life, uh, I joined Bug Life in 2017. I worked for eight years for Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. Um, and so I didn't come into kind of conservation from the most conventional route through, you know, doing mm. a degree in science and a master's. Um, I actually did a degree in fine art and then I, um, I so, so I came to conservation in a roundabout way through a kind of interest really in, in education and ensuring people were able to access nature um, and I, I studied with Herefordshire Wildlife Trust and I did a vocational placement when I was with them and, and that uh, all kind of spurred on this sort of obsession with, um, with pollinators actually because I was uh, asked to organise an event on the plight of the bumblebee and also organise some surveying of our nature reserves. And, and from there, this just absolute obsession <laughs> formed <laughs> sort of, uh, bumblebees initially and then other pollinators. Okay, well, we'll talk about bee lines in a moment, which is your big thing at the moment, I know that. Um, but um, Bug Life, is that a relatively new charity? How long has it been going? So a bug life formed in uh, 2002. Um, it, it was kind of registered as a company prior to that, but 2002 is when we had our first member of staff, um, who is Matt Shardler, who's now our CEO. So he's been with us for all that time, kind of steering the way in invertebrate conservation. Um, yeah, yeah, so. Hmm, okay. What what else did you ask me then? Did you ask me about? No, I asked a little bit about the about the charity and how long it's been going. And because you know, it's not it's not a name I'm familiar with. There's no reason why it should be. But you know, it's uh, it, you know, you are a national charity, as you quite rightly say, based in Peterborough, and you're you're you know, you've got offices around the country, I believe. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. So yeah, we are a fairly small conservation charity. Um, it's about I think twenty six members of staff at the moment. Yeah. And yeah, we're, you know, our aim is to uh, halt uh, invertebrate extinctions, reverse declines, achieving a sustainable populations. Um, and we're the only European champion for the conservation of all animals without backbones. So, you know, everything from yeah, bees to worms to snails to, you know, the small creatures that live in our fresh waters and our seas. So mm. We, we cover a vast array of, of creatures, really, and we aim to kind of be their voice um, because, you know, insects and, and other invertebrates 
are often overlooked, although they are, you know, absolutely essential to us as humans and to kind of healthy ecosystems. Mm. I was just going to say that you're absolutely right. You know, they are overlooked. And uh, I think most of us watching this video will hopefully be aware of the, the, the use of pollinators and pollination. But um, their, their, uh, their natural habitats are under threat because of urbanisation and uh, I assume uh, the use of still the use of chemicals uh, in agriculture and in gardens. Yeah, yeah, that that is that is absolutely right. So I mean, there are there's an array of factors why our our invertebrates are declining, um, which are all kind of exasperated now um, by climate change as well. But yes, we you know we've lost ninety seven percent of our species rich grasslands since the nineteen thirties. Um, and now we have kind of urban sprawl and development, you know, in development and infrastructure and then the use of, you know, yeah, kind of chemicals within our kind of agricultural systems and the dependency of, of chemicals within our agricultural systems is obviously a huge, huge issue. And um, yes, but also things like flea treatments and wormers you know, have wormers have big impacts on, you know, invertebrate species that are feed on dung um, yeah. and we you know neonicotinoids are often used as flea treatment and that gets into water and that's impacting on things in our water as well so yeah there's, it sounds it I don't want to paint a bad picture you know it sounds a bit doomy and gloomy to be honest with you um, but I know that you're at this is what the charity does of course is that you're you're fighting back and helping the invertebrates fight back and you've got this project going on the moment which I understand you're particularly passionate about yeah, is called bee lines which is is that new is that a new thing has it just been launched uh, tell us about it yeah no you're absolutely we don't we don't want to kind of focus on the doom and gloom i think we're all yeah. far too aware of the the kind of issues that we uh, face on our planet um yeah so we have two main strands to our work and that's uh, you know sort of tackling the pollinator crisis that we face currently and ensuring that we have healthy fresh waters. But yeah, I, I tend to work on our kind of pollinator conservation. Um, and yes, we, we have an exciting new, well, so it's not a new program. We've been working on bee lines for around a decade, um, but it has taken a long time to, to, to see it to where it is now, which, which is with a sort of completed uh, map of the UK. Um, and so, so bee lines essentially is our, our landscape scale solution to tackling the, um, the decline in our pollinating insects. It's a sort of ambitious program to identify opportunities for uh, restoration and creation of habitats um, within a national network. So we're aiming to sort of creating, aiming to create a kind of network of wildflowers across, across the country. Um, you could call them kind of wildflower insect superhighways, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> okay, so so cool. um, each county and region yeah. has has been mapped um, to create this kind of prioritised network, which takes in the, the best remaining wildflower rich habitats across the country. Um, yeah, so so each country, each county, I should say, is is mapped so that we sort of including every corner of the UK, um, and each county has you know north north south east west lines um in which you know we can kind of focus our efforts for for wildflower uh, uh restoration habitat restoration you know sort of supporting nature's recovery so in some terms obviously the sort of people that you're talking to are landowners you know farmers and and agricultural uh, concerns but equally there must be a sense that members of the public can actually do something practical by making sure their gardens have uh, the right flowers in them is that the way you see it yeah that's absolutely right so yeah we I mean we have big, big ambitions with this program as I said it's a prioritized network um, and it's something that everyone can contribute to so whether that, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a large, well, a farmer with a large amount of land or a large estate, uh, people with sort of private small holdings, or, you know, um, even public kind of green spaces, so local authorities, infrastructure, utility companies, 
And then, you know, on a much smaller scale, people that have gardens or community spaces, mm -hmm. school grounds, etc. So it's it's something with the aim that, you know, everyone can get involved in bee lines. Um, and it's all helping towards this national network. So that's that's the quite nice thing about it is it's one simple concept is one simple map and anyone can contribute. Um, so can we see this? I mean, you, so the maps exist now, presumably virtually uh, on your website. And so if in Gloucestershire, for instance, we could see the routes that are already there. Yes, that's absolutely right. So each, each county has been mapped. Um, and yeah, you can go onto our website and we have an interactive map and you can take a look at that and you can see where, you know, some work has already uh, taken place. And then we also have downloadable maps as well. So anyone that's kind of looking at work strategically within the county can, can download GIS files or, you know, likewise, if people are just wondering whether they are on a beeline, um, there are maps there for you to look at. But I should absolutely, I want to say at this point, and I really want to emphasize this, you know, if people do look at our maps and they find that they're not on a beeline, not to be disheartened and, and for that to not, you know, stop people from, um, from doing something to help our pollinators and other yeah. wildlife. And um, that's really important because, you know, we need to do as much as we can and we need to put the wildflowers back anywhere we can. <laughs> yeah, no, I quite agree. With you. And, um, my message to you is, can you talk to the highways agency? Because, I, you know, there must be miles and miles of verges and motorway banks in this country that you drive past that, are you know, people are mowing them or they're whatever they're doing to them, you know, they're. There must be a way of, of planting. We know I've noticed it in, in where I live in Gloucester, for instance. You know, the city council actually plants or has let verges grow naturally, and that, and I'm sure they're planted. You know, but or have been planted in the past. But to me, that seems a really good idea. You know, that we can have public that public spaces that uh, can have some uh, really attractive flowers growing in. So a bit of a rant there, sorry, but you know, I, no, I think no, that's I mean, I mean that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, there's there's a huge amount more happening and kind of more every year. And there's there's more and more momentum behind this now. And yeah, it you know, with public green spaces, you know, parks, um, you know, that they have traditionally been these areas mown within an inch yeah. of their life on a yeah. regular basis. Absolutely. And that holds such a, you know, sort of opportunity for biodiversity as well as people. And, and you know, parks can be managed for, for biodiversity and for people. Roadside verges can be managed in a way that's better for biodiversity. Obviously, yeah. health and safety must be taken into of consideration course, yeah. and sightlines and things like that. But yeah, you know, it, it doesn't have to be um, a huge onerous task to, to change the space from, you know, what it currently kind of acts as into to something that um you know supports pollinators and, and other wildlife as well you know just simple changes to mowing regimes mm. can make a huge difference um, and the same in gardens as well i mean you know we have gosh how many hectares of gardens <laughs> of lawn in fact across, across the uk you know and according so to my gardens we can change yeah. how we according how we to my research 16 million gardens in the united kingdom and 2 million acres of garden of domestic garden so yes. that's a lot of land isn't it so yes. uh, just finally i mean if uh, obviously your website is a good place to go to and we'll ask for the address but i'm hoping that on your website you've got a the maps the you know we can access the beeline maps and b do you, are, are you able to give us advice about what to plant in the garden for instance or in our in our local park um yes yeah, so well i can give you a bit of advice now and then i can okay. also um tell you where you can find some resources so i think if you're if you're you know if you have a community space you know a, a park um or a garden that there are lots of things you can do. Uh, I've already spoken about changing the kind of management of, of, of grassed areas. Um, by simply changing the mowing regime, kind of relaxing it, cutting at uh, higher levels, or if you allow an area to grow long, cut it and then remove the arisings. 
um, the, the, the mowing clippings. That's really important because by removing the grass, you lower the nutrient levels in the soil over time, making it much more favorable to wildflowers. And it's surprising if you, um, you know, if you start managing an area in that way, very quickly, you know, within five years, you'll know, you know let's say quickly, <laughs> um, more and more wildflowers will start popping up. Um, there's also, you know, planting flower beds and things like that. Your uh, wildflowers can make excellent additions to gardens. You know, it doesn't have to be horticultural cultivars. Um, cottage garden varieties of plants are really good and, you know, lots of herbs as well. Um, there's some sort of key things though, and that is that uh, insects really like, you know, open, simple flowers. So double flowers are to be avoided. And unfortunately, lots of hybrid bedding plants are, you know, bred to be kind of very showy blooms and, and in the mm. process have lost, lost their kind of uh, use as a flower to, yeah. to visiting insects. So, so there are things to be avoided. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a, yeah, simple Perfect. rules, but there's... Good. Yeah. Okay, and the website, finally, let's uh, get the most important thing of all, which is the website where all this stuff is. Yes, okay, so if you head to the, the Bug Life website, and um, so buglife.org.uk, um, you can head to the, the Bee Lines section, or the gardening section on our website, and you will find lots of information about managing land for, for pollinators in our pollinator guidance, um, as well as community spaces and gardens. And then we also have our gardening section as well, which has lots and lots of information. Brilliant. Hayley, it's great to talk to you today and the very best of luck with the Beelines project. Okay, thank you very much, Mark.